meeting. So uh, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the Archives Committee in this new municipal year. Lovely to, to see everybody. Um, first of all, can I welcome Councillor Jen Rayner back onto the committee. Jen, it's lovely to, to see you and to have you back on the committee. And um, you're going to be bringing all your knowledge and experience from your period of service previously on the Archives Committee. But of course, having been Cabinet Member for Education, I'm sure that's going to be hugely valuable to the committee as well. So uh, lovely to see you and uh, uh, we'll all be looking uh, forward to your uh, insightful comments uh, as the meetings go by. At the same time, I'd like to record thanks to Councillor Mike Dirk, who has left the committee. He's gone on to uh, Pastures New, but would like to record the committee's thanks to Mike for his contribution to the committee, always passionate, enthusiastic and very supportive of archives. And uh, we'll miss his contribution, but at the same time, we value what he's brought to the committee in the past. So thank you very much, Mike, in your absence. I'm sure somebody will convey our thanks to him and we wish him well in his new duties. So, uh, first of all, apologies for absence then, Gareth. Do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair, from Councillor Peter Black, from Sarah Perrons and Andrew Dudley as well. Right. OK, thank you very much. And are there any disclosures of personal or prejudicial interests? Any disclosures? No? Nobody's got their hands up? That's good. Thank you very much. The next item is the minutes of the last meeting. So first of all, for accuracy, um, <clears throat> anything on page one? Anything on page two? Anything on page three? And anything on page four? No? So. May I have your approval that the minutes are an accurate record? Everyone agreed? I shall take silence as affirmation. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> um, are there any matters arising from the minutes uh, which is not which are not on the agenda? Does anybody have any matters to raise? Not from no? me, but um... no. No hands going up. <clears throat> no, I just have one quick query, Kim, if I may, just to ask. Um, uh, Lorna left the service in December. So is, is that post still vacant? I seem to recall you mentioned something as, as, as to how you were going to fill that post at the last meeting. But perhaps you could refresh at least my memory of, yes, of what you're going certainly. to do. Um, so um, I think this probably um, uh, gives us an opportunity to look at the staff structure for um, the uh, uh, for the future, and to some extent, that's going to depend on the one of the issues that we're going to discuss this morning about the um, uh, the British Hamstalls building um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 about the way the service might do, be delivered in the in the future. So, I'm sort of holding fire on the. Uh, a delegated powers report till till we know where we're going with that but we okay. we might potentially for example be working much more closely more closely with local studies uh, section um in future okay thank you kim that's helpful uh, louise you've got your hand up thank you yeah i don't know if, if kim was going to mention this in his report later on but just for as a matter of rising he'd, he'd, he'd put that um i wasn't at the last meeting sorry i gave my apologies but he'd put that um the blue plaque for Jesse Donaldson was going to be unveiled. And I believe that the sort of formal, although it's gone up, the formal unveiling didn't happen because of Perder and various other issues. But yes. hopefully there will be a, a, a formal event coming soon. So it's a market. So so it's there. But yes. Yeah. 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 Just to, yes, to uh, provide uh, information on that. So obviously that wasn't the, I, I was mentioning that in passing because obviously it's not, the archive service isn't responsible for the blue plaque scheme. Uh, that's, within cultural services and overseen by Councillor Robert Francis Davis. But the um, uh, since we've done a, a fair bit of work, prep preparatory and research and so on, but it's going to be un uh, formally unveiled on June the 19th, 
which is a significant day for um, its so-called Freedom Day in the USA because it was the date that the I think it was the state of Texas signed the uh, uh, abolition of slavery. And so I think each state, US state did that. And as a result, uh, it's become a national day of uh, celebration in, in the USA. Um, and it's known as Juneteenth. Um, so we've chosen that day. Yeah. It's There's going to be a physical unveiling, but it's very limited because of COVID. So there, there are only 11 guests allowed in the thing and it's between the University of Council and Jazz Heritage Wales so uh, it'll be a very low-key affair but uh, at least it's, it's going to have a physical unveiling anyway yeah. and, yeah. and and Councillor Robert Francis Davis and Councillor Yvonne Jardine are going to attend from uh, Swansea Council uh, along with Tracy McNulty. Good. Good. Thank you Kim, it'd be lovely to see it up and um, uh, a real um, a, a, an interesting uh, day nationally, and of course, it, it also this also ties in with the article in the archives report, super article about uh, Jesse Donaldson in, in, yes, in archives. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, so, yeah. So it's all very timely. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, if there's no more matters arising, I'll hand over to you to take us through your reports. Okay, well, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm afraid the report is very thin uh, this quarter because of the, the, you know, the limited service that we're providing. So, apologies, and we may not fill our usual time, but uh, no doubt there'll be opportun more opportunity for discussion. Um, service has been uh, uh, closed during the. Uh, a fair proportion of the the quarter because of the the latest lockdown. So we reopened on Tuesday, six of April, just after Easter, um, and continuing on an appointment only basis, in in the same manner that we had done during the um, uh, late summer and autumn of uh, last last year. Um, basically, the numbers are very very thin uh, and Neath isn't open at all. Um, but the, the key thing is that we are open to the public. We have a service and um, compared to a number of services, for example, the service in Cardiff has only just opened this week. It opened on Tuesday and that's uh, it's been closed for a year. So I'm pleased that we have um, uh, we have opened when we have been able to to, mm -hmm. to to be open following Welsh government guidelines, and we uh, though we weren't open on the very first day that it was possible. There was a little bit of confusion uh, in the Welsh government announcement as to whether archives were included with libraries, because the first minister announced that libraries could reopen. I think it was the week before, uh, so I had to seek clarification as to whether it was because in the previous announcements it was libraries and archives and they had included the word archives but this time round they just said libraries and so it wasn't wasn't sure whether archives were just uh, so, so I had to go to Welsh Government to do some thinking and I think it was just a slip on Welsh Government's part so that that meant that we uh, we had a bit of delay because we weren't quite sure whether we could uh, reopen uh, um, but we we opened as soon as we could mm -hmm. Not we're not very busy to be honest, but we're open the um, full uh, four days that we're open uh, have were open before the lockdown in uh, in Swansea and before before the pandemic, um, and we're open on an appointment only basis, and we close at lunchtime, and we can manage a maximum of four people in the search room at any one time. But the, there are days when we don't have anybody booked in. Like for example, we've got nobody booked in today. So uh, uh, I think the the key thing is that um, we are we are there, um, and the service is available if if people want to use us. And um, uh, we're not doing a huge amount of publicity. Obviously, if you go on your web our website, then you can uh, see that we're open. But we, we know there's no marketing to say come along to the archives simply because of the uh, the, the difficulties. And, and one of the key key problems with the way that we're able to run the service at the moment is that you have to order all your documents in advance. And 
you have to know what you want to look at. So you can't drift in through the door and say, you know, I, I'm in a boundary dispute with my neighbour. Um, I what can you do to help help me in the historic records? Or those kinds of things. You know, we we we're, we're essentially um, providing a service to academics, students. Uh, family historians, people who know what they want to look at and they can order in advance. And um, so all, all those casual users are um, uh, uh, somewhat excluded at the moment. Having said which, we are looking to um, reopen the Family History Centre, which I think is the next stage in Swansea, and that would involve browsing of public PCs, which we haven't done up to now, but is uh being undertaken in the central library so uh there are there are rules around that so we'll so be learning lessons from the library but i hope that we can reopen the family history center on a appointment only basis so that's essentially providing computer access for the um uh members of the public who want to come into uh, to use a public pc maybe they don't have a pc at home or maybe they need a little bit of help um it's i think i think before before covid it was more of a club feeling it was sort of people came in to to socialize so there were people who were interested in so uh, family history were essentially coming in on the same days and they'd meet their friends and you know they, they there were no social distancing and everything else and i'm afraid that's all been a bit blown out of the water by the you know the need to retain the social distancing and so, so I don't know, don't know how successful it will be, but I, I think we need to keep pushing the boundaries really as to what we can do and uh, hopefully the rules will be relaxed at some point, uh, whether it's later this year or, or further into the future. Mm -hmm. I'll take any questions that on this section one that anybody would like to raise or any comments that people yeah. would like to make. Any, any comments or questions from anybody? Uh, Louise. Let's go. Thank you. Just very briefly, I wanted to um, just say that I have been into the archives as a reader in the period since you reopened and just to say, you know, how good the arrangements are there. And I think, you know, we should congratulate him and his team for being so proactive mm. and getting the service reopened, you know, albeit on what you consider to be a slim down uh, basis. But just being able to have that facility is fantastic. So I, I just think it's a huge tribute to the staff. Well done. Absolutely. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Yes. I'm sure every, everybody would endorse those comments of, of Louise. Wyndham, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, Kim, have you any idea or any inclination when the facility at Nice will reopen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have been in discussion with um, Jan Watkins about this. Um, uh, I think one of the problems with the Mechanics Institute is that you can't maintain social distancing within this. It, as you know, no doubt, it's, it's quite a cramped space. Um, I my feeling is it's going to have to wait until the two meter social distance rule is uh, relaxed. Um, I think the other thing that bothers me, uh, and I have raised this with the antiquarians, is the um, the willingness of the volunteers to come back because many of the volunteers uh, on the Neath Antiquarian Society are quite elderly and, and my personal feeling is that it's going to have knocked the confidence of a lot of older people uh, about meeting strangers and socializing i mean uh, the we have to we have to see but I, i've asked jan whether she would check with the volunteers to find out how many are willing to to be re-established in the road to it it's a little bit early yet but we can only really run the service the two days a week with one day where we have help from the, the volunteers and uh, as you probably know, the members of the Neath Antiquarian Society, like so many local history groups, are, you know, an older age range. Um, there are relatively few, if any, really young members in the in the History Society. It's a, it's a problem with all history societies, I'm afraid. 
Any other comments? Well, thank you, Kim. And I think the return to normality is going to be slowly but surely, isn't it? And taking it one step at a time. And um, uh, we just have to see what, what, what happens and, and how people respond to things as well. But uh, I think it's wonderful uh, that you have been able to keep open and you know when you when you tell us the Cardiff's been actually been closed for a year and we look at the service that you've been providing for for us and and for local people to have kept open as you have and battling with all the restrictions and the difficulties is um, is is a real is a real plus for us but it's also a testament to to the staff and their commitment and, and dedication so uh, great so Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, yes, we hope we hope things do, you know, go from strength to strength, really, you know, in, in terms of, of of the opening. And we don't have anything that knocks us back too much, but fingers crossed. And we'll have something to look forward to when the Family History Centres uh, open again as well. And I think there's nothing wrong with having that sort of clubby atmosphere, is there? It'd be nice if that returns, because quite clearly yeah, yeah. people enjoyed that. They enjoyed meeting people. And, you know, that's um, that social aspect of it is a very positive thing as well. So people will gradually get back to that, uh, I'm sure, in due course. Yeah, the same the same in Nice as well. Actually, I see that uh, Craig and, and Wayne are uh, in on the meeting and probably as we look towards what the uh, what we going to do with regard to reopening Neath, I'll probably uh, take advice from Wayne about what's happening in these Patobot libraries and obviously Craig has um, overall responsibility uh, overseeing my work in Neath Patobot so uh, yeah. I'll liaise with him as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether either of you gentlemen wanted to say anything, uh, sorry putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I can come in now. Uh, Craig, uh, oh, is going to say uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Kim and I have spoken previously about different elements regarding the Neath there now, and I've also had some contact as well with the antiquarians as well, where they've been keeping me informed about some of their um, current work streams and what they're doing at present. The, the, the major concern for us is obviously the ability to socially distance at the premises. It is a much smaller venue, as Kim just alluded to, but we're constantly looking at ways, obviously, to try and see how we can assist in that regard. But I think we are very much dependent on some of the, the current regulations and um, Welsh Government guidance being amended to try and facilitate people getting back into the premises in different ways. So it, it's constantly under review in that sense, and we'll be working with Kim accordingly to, to try and achieve that. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. OK, uh, if I'll, I'll move on, if that's yes. OK, into section two, which is about our out outreach work, which has all been online. Um, I have to say some of the things that we have learned from the uh, uh, the experience of the lockdowns will probably ha be able to take forward. And I think one of the things that uh, has proved quite popular is these online talks. Yeah. Um, so we had a report in the previous quarter from uh, February that we had Dr. John Alban speaking about the um, uh, Three Nights Blitz in February on the anniversary of the uh, uh, one of the nights of the Three Nights Blitz. I can't remember which one it was, the second or the third, I think. But the um, that was very well attended. Um, the, there was a follow up uh, talk. Uh, during this quarter and it was attended by 59 people so it I think the previous one was about 176 this was 59 but this is still quite good uh, attendance for a talk and if, if uh, in normal times we had advertised an evening talk uh, where people had to come out of the house particularly in winter you know uh, 60 people mm. or thereabouts would be a, a really good audience and I, I doubt whether we would have achieved any anything near that I mean I think 20 would be considered a good audience for a thing so I think online talks is probably one of the few positive things I can take from the experience of uh, this uh, I think because we're not we're, we're the custodians of the records but what I think what people want in the audience are uh, historians to talk about interpreting the records so it's not necessarily something that the archive staff can uh, can deliver but uh, if you have um, 
uh, uh, particularly an author of a book that pe many people might have or uh, acknowledged expert on an aspect of history. And if we advertise it well, uh, I think this is these are really good way of going forward. Um, uh, so uh, uh, no, it has been suggested that one of the um, possible talks in the future um, uh, I'm slightly aware that this is being recorded and <laughs> published, but and I haven't asked it yet. But uh, Dinah Evans' uh, uh, Rebuilding Swansea, very popular book, is uh, I think that's a topic that is of fascination to um, uh, many Swansea uh, residents. It's about why Swansea was rebuilt after the war in the way that it was, and it sort of like there's a bit of a continuity there, and that we had a like uh, a talk on the Blitz and about the physical remnants of the Blitz uh, as seen in the modern footprint of uh, today's city and uh, maybe that's a, a talk for the future. Um, and we've worked on social media, obviously we were working with social media beforehand. Um, and then I just mentioned that I published our annual report I think it was a week ago today, if I remember right. Yes, it was is when the papers came out for this meeting. So uh, there is a link in the uh, uh, in the report there uh, that you've got the um, uh, agenda pack and uh, it should uh, take you through to the annual report if you haven't uh, ma managed to uh, uh, to click on that link already, I would recommend having a read. Um, it's a summary of the the year's activities, which are relatively limited. But actually, when I came to write them, I was quite surprised. You know that we had actually done quite a quite a fair amount for a, a very um, quiet year, uh, and there there are a number of local history articles mm. in there as well. Um, highly diverse. I would say this is the um, the most diverse set of local history articles that we've uh, ever had um, in in terms of uh, people that we've asked and the um, uh, uh, the range that we've got. So we've got a really interesting article from um, Andrew Dully on the uh, Nice medieval charters, and we end up with um, an article from. Uh, former councillor Johan Richard uh, about a murder stone in a cemetery in Valindra and in between those two uh, bookends in the thing we've got an um, uh, interesting article by the local studies librarian on the uh, um, black boxer uh, Lloyd Davis uh, who's part of the, the hidden history of, of, of Swansea and um, uh, as has been mentioned before an article by uh, um, Jen Wilson on um, Jesse Donaldson. So, uh, 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 just to, so I met, make sure I mention all the articles. Uh, there's one on the uh, illuminated addresses to Sir Henry Hussey yeah. Vivian, um, uh, which we purchased um, uh, during the course of the year, which uh, I was really pleased that we managed to uh, uh, to get that to add those to our collections, because as you'll see, uh, they are very n nice works of art as well as you know, being of historic interest. And so they adorn the front and the back covers of the report and there three of them are, um, or four of them, I think, are, are, are reproduced in full color in, in, within the report. So I uh, hope you enjoy reading it or, or have enjoyed reading it. Uh, uh, I'll take any comments on anything up to that point before I go on to the um, uh, the history of slavery. Jen. Can't. Your mic's off, Jen. Too many buttons to push here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the online talks were an incredible success and I suspect you might have undercounted the number of people who participated or took part because I did notice at the beginning when we were all settling down and checking the layout and everything that in the majority of cases there was more than one person sitting on the settee. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we were possibly nearer twice that figure. Mm -hmm. uh, so congratulations on that um, and certainly 
they were extremely enjoyable and the questions that were asked were fantastic. I'd also like to comment on the speed of email responses from the department. They have been phenomenally fast and accurate. I know staff have been working at home. I don't know if you had them on a rotor. I think a number of other council departments could possibly learn from this experience. But the quick response was extraordinary. And I think the department should be congratulated on the entire outreach service that we've been experiencing. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, just to a uh, yes, we we are on a, a rotor, so um, uh, where uh, one team A uh, comes in on Tues Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and team B on Thursdays and Fridays. So I'm in team B, so I head team B. So uh, that's I would normally be in the office. Obviously, as you can see, I'm in the office at the moment. That uh, uh, I. Uh, would normally be in the office on a Thursday or Friday. Uh, Councillor Jones, uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Great, th th thank you, uh, Chair. Could, I'd like to congratulate uh, Kim and his team as well for the great work they've been doing on social media and uh, you know the excellent articles and films that you actually put up. <laughs> I shared many of them and uh, you know uh, they were so well received by everybody because of their quality and I, I, they, they really were enjoyed. So uh, I'd like to encourage other people on the call as well uh, to share them as well if they can, because it shows the excellent work that the archive service does in, 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 uh, in West Morgan. So really well done for that. And they are excellent. And I know that the public and the responses that I've had, they've been really well received. Thanks, Lyndon. Thank you. Chair, just to say, I, I put the link to the annual report in the chat and I'll email it round to everyone after as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and can I just say, Kim, that um, I, I really do applaud the annual report. It is excellent. The articles are really so interesting. And as you rightly say, such a diverse set of articles in there. I mean, it's. They're all absolutely fascinating uh, in, in different ways. And it, to me, it just highlights the value of the archive service and, and what a gem of a service we actually have in this area. And a couple of other things that I picked up from the report, which I really do think we should be very, very proud of, is that West Glamorgan Archives is seen to be the first in Wales uh, there was that table as first in Wales and the fourth in England in Wales. So I think, you know, to be so highly regarded is fantastic. That's on Facebook followers, I think. Yes, well, yes. Facebook, yeah. But I mean, yes. it's, you know, yes. nevertheless, it's out there, isn't it? You know, and, yes. uh, you know, it's, 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 it's fantastic. Yes. And um, but the other thing that I read off was the death of Philip Hubbard from the Neath Antiquarian Society. Yes, right. So um, that had passed me by. So do apologise for that. But I just thought that was worth noting because he obviously gave many years of valuable service yeah. to the NAS. And uh, I'm sure he, he will be greatly missed. But very many congratulations to your staff and, and yourself for putting this report together. And it really does fly the flag for the archive service. So so very well done. I also think it, it, it is a, a very much a snapshot in time, isn't it? Because yes. uh, yeah. a focus in the report is about how you've had to use social media and uh, what, what the impact has been. But again, I think that shows the versatility and the flexibility of the service and the staff as well. So, so well done. Yeah. Well done. I think one of the, I'm really pleased that uh, the, the annual reports, we have a continuous run going back to the start of the service and they were out of fashion very much. Uh, my, my predecessor, Susan Beckley, instituted them and, and prior to that, uh, there were Glamorgan Record Office annual reports, so it was a constant run. Uh, and then, because of the cost of um, paper and sending them out and printing and everything else, uh, I think most offices stopped doing annual reports. And then, of course, the possibility of online publication came along, and they've come back into fashion because uh, it's it there's no cost involved other than the time to compile it in in creating an online annual report so we moved from the paper to the online version whereas i think a lot of offices sort of stopped doing the paper printing and then there was a gap and they're coming back into fashion now simply because 
you can sort of create anybody can create a magazine mm. now i mean I, I do that myself and i don't particularly have the skills but it's it's uh, nice to kind of move things around the page and so on and uh, and uh, try to make something that is an attractive read uh, and it's also good for the staff because they save things during the year so if we get something nice in like a, a compliment or um uh, uh an email from a teacher or something like that it gets saved into the folder and then we can um, compile it all together to uh, to give a picture of the year okay Lovely. moving on yeah. um the the project regarding the sources of uh for, for the hist uh, history for, of the historic slave trade and wales's connection with it um it, it do, i have to say this is a very slow burn so i do sort of um uh, uh, this this will probably there'll probably be a mention in this in future quarterly reports. But the, the thing is that it it's morphing and it's growing every quarter. So it sort of started out as something that was going to go on the uh, Swansea Council website on the uh, West Glamorgan pages. Uh, it's now become a pro pan Wales project in which uh, all the local Welsh archives are taking part and three of Wales's universities, Bangor, Swansea and Cardiff. Um, the the aim of the project now is that we would um, provide resource material on the digital learning platform hub, which many people will be familiar with. Um, the idea would be that the um, uh, the, doc the documents which are going to be drawn from across Wales um, would have context provided, but there would be no overall narrative. So I think one of the things that we don't do as archivists is say uh, Wales has a history to be ashamed of or Wales has a history to be proud of. You know, it, it, what we do is present the evidence and maybe the teachers may do that, but obviously in today's learning environment, I think it's up to the pupils to to do that. So you provide the resources, you provide the context, and then you ask of them the questions uh, for them to come to those sort of um, uh, uh, conclusions themselves. And obviously it's a very complex and muddied history of um, uh, 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 implication by some very large estates across Wales in, in the slave uh, trade and um, also uh, campaigns against slavery, which particularly uh, associated with nonconformity and uh, uh, very particular um, nonconformist sex in sects in particular like the Quakers and, um, and and so on so it's a very complex picture there is a huge range of documents if you read the section in the annual report about it you'll see we have um, uh, submitted it to the uh, working group um, uh, chaired by Professor Charlotte Williams at Bangor U University uh, she said some very nice things about it um, Dr Marion Gwynn who was on the working group said some more um, sort of practical things going forward that um, you know, she was convinced there's more and I think that that is probably is the uh, uh, so we, what we've what we've done is uh, um, our archive officers have been asked to search their um, uh, their catalogues on based on keywords like slave slavery and so on um, it's interesting the National Archives have done this work and they came up with 60 terms that they thought the catalog should be searched on and uh, i've been trying to um find out because i can't find any information online as to what these 60 terms are uh, and i've been using my contacts in the, in the national archives and it, this is a reminder of myself that i need to follow those up because the nearest i've got uh, was a contact saying i think i know the person who created these 60 terms that people should search on and i haven't got any further so problems with email discussions sometimes they just fizzle out because you forget to reply to uh, uh, the thing but um, basically in order to try to locate as much material as we possibly can uh, we need to search more widely on uh, uh, whatever uh, terms the uh, well if, if the TNA came up with 60 terms I think we'll probably live with that that sounds quite 
quite a lot. Um, uh, and what was suggested as a way forward was that the um, uh, the project group, i.e. the local archives and the universities, should um, try out a, a small module because the idea, I think, for the working group on the Wales National Curriculum is that there should be a series of small modules on various subjects. So you're not going to lump the whole thing about the historic slave trade, but you'll be looking at small modules. And I think one of the ones in discussion with one of my archivists, um, uh, I think one small module that we could work on would be um, diversity in 18th century Wales, because I this is a relatively small subject and there are records relating to it. Primarily, um, uh, it was quite fashionable in 18th century Britain for um, the landed estates to have black servants and there were uh, black people living in Wales at much earlier than perhaps many people uh, think and they come into the records and in many cases or some cases uh, I should say they set themselves up uh, there were uh, uh, former servants who set themselves up as uh, as gentlemen they were maybe left something in the the will of their um, former employer and uh, uh, set themselves up and then the, all sorts of comp complicated histories developed and I think that's a really interesting uh, I, I overuse the phrase, or I think as archivists we overuse this phrase of hidden history, but uh, I think it's probably a uh, reasonable thing to, to to say. And it's a relatively compact topic, so I thought maybe we could uh, develop a, a, a uh, that as a sub theme, develop a teaching resource on that, and then try it out on teachers to see how well they uh, found that. So, for example, is there enough context given? Um, do they need more? Do they need a lesson plan? Um, and so on. So um, I think that's probably a smaller topic than perhaps uh, certainly I would not tackle the um, the bigger topic of um, the Wales's landed estates and their involvement, own, ownership of slave plantations and uh, uh, their involvement in the slave trade, because that's quite a, a big one. I think at that point we need to get a project officer in. And Welsh Government have indicated that funding would be available. Obviously, this is a priority not just for all local authorities, but also for Welsh Government. It's part of the re-evaluation of um, our collections, how our heritage collections, our statues, our monuments and, and, and so on. So it's uh, it's an important piece of work and I think it's got to be done right, which is why I say it's a bit of a slow burn, really. Um, there's a lot of goodwill, not a huge amount of resource at the moment. Uh, I, I do have that feeling I'll be reporting sort of very slow steps on, on this. Uh, I'd like to to move forward significantly, but um, uh, I just think this will not this this will continue, but it, it's just moving very, very slowly. Um, but I think that I think that's a good picture of where we've got to, which I think is a little bit further than last quarter when I reported. I'll stop there if anybody would like to make any comments. Louise. I think Councillor James had already come in before me. I'll let, I'll let him go first. Oh, no, you go first. Ladies first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, sorry, Hugh. I, ha sorry, I, I didn't. I, I didn't have you on my your picture, so I didn't oh. see that. So I do oh, apologise. No. So just just to give my ongoing thanks to Kim and the team for for their obvious you know enthusiasm for this topic and the hard work that they're doing and linking in with the with the sort of national picture um and 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 yeah i mean that 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 sort of project you suggest on the sort of hidden history of, of the diversity sounds really really interesting and i think you know you make you make the point well those of us who are quite passionate about this topic often get quite frustrated of people saying oh why are you looking at black history at the expense of welsh history yeah. when it's, mm. it's one and the same you know yes. obviously so and yeah. i think you know if we if we pull these stories out and we publicize them i think that's going to you know really help um make that point and um, yeah, really, just really excited to to see the resources when they're when they're they're completed. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I think I'll just make a comment on that maybe before we go on to the other things. But I think one of the thing this is going to be one of those projects where 
I think we can have a certain amount of pride that it started mm -hmm. in West Glamorgan, Definitely. but it's not going to have a West Glamorgan brand on when it comes out. It's going to be uh, an all Wales thing and, you know, we'll slip slip down in the, we'll just be, well, as we're towards the end of the alphabet, we're normally down the very bottom <laughs> and normally <laughs> then Wrexham comes last after, so I'm quite used to that. So, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a certain amount of pride that we can have that, you know, at least the thought came. Okay. It's the same as with the archives card readers ticket that, you know, it, I always like to think it started in Civic Centre in Swansea, but it's a national thing now and it, uh, we've got no uh, uh, particular claim to fame over it but uh, uh, one good thing is that it's by, uh, it recognizes Welsh bilingualism so we've got a, a Welsh bilingual ticket but it's got no thing. it's just just pleased that we started the thinking on it uh, a lot of hands raised so I should shut yes. up yes uh, I think uh, Robert I think you were next I think he was before me oh sorry Hugh yes yeah. I do apologize Hugh yes that's all right, Robert. You're a gentleman as well. Uh, Chair, a, a question I'd like to ask him is, I think this is a, a very, very important subject, as you can guess, with the, with the media coverage over the last years, particularly what went on in Bristol and other places. There's a great interest in the slave trade, and uh, it must have gone on a bit here, but I do admire, Kim, the way you're tackling this as the archivist, because you're dealing with the three major universities in Wales. And as you say, it'll have a brand bigger than ourselves. But there is a lot of interest in it, and not just you know from schools, senior schools, maybe some junior schools. There's a lot of interest of the public out there. And uh, I think it's not going to go away. And I think it will probably put the truth back in because people don't really realise what's happened. You came up, Kim, with that wonderful uh, comment, and I didn't realise that, you know, people in-house who working for large estates and houses, for example. So I think the way forward is right, and you're doing a good job here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Hugh, I just remembered from what you said, actually, I should have mentioned the National Library of Wales is one of the participants oh, yes. as well. Yeah. And I've left that off the report and I've suddenly suddenly remembered it's not it's yeah. just quite a significant player, actually. So, uh, 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 yes, it's the universities, the local archives and the National Library of Wales. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, now I think it's Robert. Yeah, just want to endorse uh, and welcome what you're proposing there, Kim, and, and what you've described. Um, you know, on the modular approach in, in particular, because, you know, we don't want some kind of tokenistic tick box exercise here, tick box yeah. exercise. This has got to be something that that's uh, part of the curriculum um, and, and integrated within, within it and also something that's flexible enough to capture the outcomes of, of the emerging research, you know, as, as this topic becomes uh, more and more subject to more and more research, I think it's important that that is reflected in the curriculum that each child accesses. So uh, absolutely endorse what, what you're doing and welcome it. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. And, and Jen. Thank you. Yes, congratulate Kim and all the other archivists who are working on this. Uh, it's really important and interesting that prime resources are made available. And there is a huge task in going through all our archives and looking at how they have been uh, recorded, labelled and extracting the information. And I think that job is much bigger than uh, people who made the original suggestions realise when they did it. There is a huge research project to be undertaken here. And it's absolutely essential that pupils have access to primary resources rather than just commentaries so they can look and consider themselves. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to all of you working on that. Uh, as Robert has said, modular basis is really good. Um, and I think the early um, study of slavery and blacks in Swansea in the 18th century and indeed the 16th century is a good starting point. There is a lot there. Um, and as has been said, there is huge interest in this. Will we ever be able to look at the history of railways and industrialization without looking at those people who got compensation following the ending of slavery? Yes. So yeah. it is a massive, massive topic. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really pleased to see people are working on this. 
Uh, and, you know, I think schools will be picking up on this very quickly. But the essential is that we are extracting from long held stores primary documents that will become available because they have been rediscovered is too big a word. They have been re-recorded in the archive system. So really pleased to see how this is getting on. And as Louisa said, black history is Welsh history and has been for hundreds of years. And we need to really keep stating that clearly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Jen. Well, huge support from us all and enthusiasm for this project, Kim. And we look forward to, to further updates um, as, as the uh, yeah. meetings uh, come by in the future. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I thank you very much for the uh, support there. Uh, I, I, I think I'm reassured from that that I won't necessarily be boring you when you no. uh, <laughs> this comes up every quarter. <laughs> No, we'd be really, really interested in it, Kim. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's really important. It, it certainly um, links to what I think archives, what part of the role of archives are, uh, and particularly for school um, school pupils. So I think uh, uh, this thing that we, we don't necessarily present conclusions, and I think when the project started out, I think it started out with, um, well, we tell a narrative and we don't necessarily tell the the whole story for Wales, but I think what we really just do is put it out there. And I think teachers nowadays are also, um, uh, you know, we've all moved on as a society that we, what we really need is the pupils to actually look at the moral complexity of the situation and then come up with, you know, they may come up with solution um, conclusions that are based on their understanding, obviously, the different age ranges and everything else. But I think what we need to do in terms of educational resources is put the the sources out and then say, you know, what do you think? Uh, and that I think that's certainly the way, uh, not the way I was necessarily taught history in school, but, but we were often told this is what you need to think <laughs> if you want to pass your uh, exams. Uh, so, uh, but I think Le leading to uh, you know much more complexity, and I think this is a, a subject that uh, uh, will is also links to you know the diversity of our modern society as well. It's not like uh, you know who was responsible for the French Revolution or or whatever. It's uh, it's something that relates to you know our uh, uh, our current society. So these these are really important issues for pupils to engage with. This will be a hugely influential and significant project. So I say we look forward to hearing more updates. Uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, shall we okay. go on to the the proposed yes. new site for archives? I just looked at the clock and I said, yes, we'll go through it. Now. <laughs> I'm so sorry, because this is a big topic as well. So uh, I, I, I shall outline the developments in the last quarter relating to the uh, the project uh, for the city centre hub in the former uh, British Home Stores building and where it's got to over the last uh, three months. Uh, there has been some development since the end of the quarter, so I think it's, I'll take the report up to the present day really, rather than sort of just stick with March and May. So um, I have had, during the quarter, I had one meeting with the uh, uh, the Corius team, Corius being the company that is uh, has been uh, uh, given awarded the contract with the uh, for the um, multidisciplinary team, and that included the architects, uh, who's uh, based with uh, Austin Smith Lord in Cardiff, um, and that is was part of the Reba Stage One uh, uh, work, which uh, as for those who are familiar with Reba stages, this is about looking around uh, uh, around the um, budgets, the uh, um, various uh, requirements of the uh, potential occupants of the building. I'm probably not phrasing this very well. It's not my not my strongest point actually. Is the uh, uh, the building uh, aspect. So um, this is why I'm very pleased to say that. Were, uh, I mentioned in our previous report that we subscribed to the National Conservation Service, which is a um, national, it's it's a private organisation. It sounds like it's a public authority, but it isn't. But I've uh, work, been working with Chris Woods from the National Conservation Service. We subscribed and uh, uh, um, uh, 
uh, got four, four days of his time. So we paid for four days of his consultancy and he's been helping me a terrific amount. Um, the uh, so as I say, the multidisciplinary multidisciplinary team will uh, have, have finished Reba stage one. The, they haven't got to Reba stage two, which is coming up with the concept design. And uh, and I wait to, by by the time we have the next meeting, I'm sure it will have been issued. In fact, with uh, probably have moved on to further Reba stages because I'm not sure that by the time we have our next meeting, they won't have finished their work. I can't remember the uh, the date that they're they're due to finish because the the whole project is meant to be delivered by September of next year. Um, I, I will stress once again that the the. Uh, the archives, the, the concept, the project concept is around the city centre hub. The archives is very much a, um, well, will the archives go in or, or will it not go in? So it, it it may be that it's not suitable to go in the building. Um, where Whether or not it can go in depends whether the concept, the REAP stage two um, design meets the British standard, the uh, BS 16893, and that is the uh, national recognised standard for archival storage. And that, that's BS 16893 is based around some really key uh, concerns about archival storage and if we want to say what the three pillars of those are one is security um, obviously we don't want people breaking into the thing uh, the second is fire and flood and fire is a particular concern in this type of uh, building and the third is about a controlled environment uh, controlling the temperature and humidity um, now, the work that I've done with Chris, and we've been, obviously the, the building's closed at the moment, we have been, he's been to Swansea and we've been on a site visit, um, and he's had a look from the outside, and his finding was that you would essentially have to uh, create a box within a box, I mean if we take the building as a box, and you'd need, the, what we're really concerned with is the um, uh, uh, the archive store when so we're not essentially concentrating on the public area, which is not tremendously different from some of the other public areas. But what the the BS one six eight nine three is about the storage of archival uh, items, and that has to meet those three requirements. Um, it he thinks it's feasible. Uh, he thinks it. Could be done. It should be done at the north end of the uh, the building because one some some of the key concerns in terms of um, maintaining this stable temperature and humidity is the uh, th so-called thermal inertia, which I'm sure is, if you're not familiar with the term, it's self-explanatory. But you don't want to be having to use huge amounts of electricity in order to try to control the environment of a uh, um, uh, a storage area which is subject to a huge thermal range. So typically, as you're familiar from houses, you know, if you've got a south facing house, it heats up during the day because of the sun. Uh, you don't want that uh, to happen. You don't necessarily want to be in the roof area, attic area where you've got the, the roof, uh, heat loss through the roof. Uh, essentially, what he uh, uh, suggested, I and mean, this is this this will be um, uh, a matter of whether it whether we do go forward or not, is that is that in in order to create this thermal inertia, you need to base the the storage area on the the ground floor or the basement, and we've discovered that the basement is not really very suitable because it's subdivided, so uh, it creates a. Uh, Thermal inertia is enhanced by being having a contact with the the ground. So putting the archives above the uh, a public area, which maybe gets heated during the winter, it might be quite hot, and on on the ground floor. And then uh, uh, during the night, when probably the heating is uh, not so probably maintained, but not so well, it would it would heat up during the day and cool down at night. What you're doing is trying to end up with a mechanical and electrical 
solution to something where you're not using the uh, the natural properties of the building. So if you're familiar with the British Home Stores, it's quite a long site, north-south, aligned north-south, and it has got uh, a north north end that uh, is relatively um, uh, not affected by these uh, um, uh, uh, this this thermal temperature rates. So he he recommended that the the MDT do some thermal modelling of the building. So looking at the way that the temperature alters across across the building. So I think this is all going to come out at Reba stage two, and it's probably probably going to be a matter of knowing whether the other interests are paramount because I have to go back to the point that this is not designed as the new archive. It's a city centre hub for contact services. And, you know, we're not the the major player in, in the whole scheme because it, it's it's based around uh, providing uh, frontline services with the possibility of the library and the possibility of the archive going in in there, so a decision will have to be made. Uh, it may be, have been made by the time of the next committee meeting. Uh, I'm not quite sure who makes that decision, but uh, uh, it. it uh, what I would say is that it really, we really have to make sure that the solution uh, meets the whole standard of the uh, British standard, because anything less. It would be a botched job in my opinion and uh, in this respect we will be also guided by Welsh Government and by the National Archives because uh, a fair proportion round about a quarter of our collections are actually records of UK central government uh, the vast majority being the magistrates court records so we we have to be guided by the external agencies and essentially I'm working alongside and in coordination with Welsh Government, uh, the Welsh Government uh, Agency, uh, MALD, um, uh, now the Department of Culture and Sport, uh, and uh, the National Archives. So, so I think as a council, if if Swansea Council is uh, the key stakeholder, I think we go back to this, does it meet BS 16893? And if it doesn't, now, it may be that the, the uh, we have to go to plan B or whatever. Um, I, I'll stop at this point. I, I'm aware that we've kind of gone on onto a major topic uh, and uh, we've sort of bumping up against the end of the meeting. But uh, if any members would like to make any comments. Any observations or comments from anybody? Jen, you just put up your hand. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think Kim is quite right. We have to have a repository which meets the relevant standards. Mm -hmm. Essential in its own right, but I'm also aware that part of our holdings are not necessarily owned by ourselves that we've had given or we've bought. We have items on deposit. And I would really worry if the owners started reviewing what was held in Swandi and decided to move it to Cardiff, where they would be able to meet those standards, because I think that would be a big loss to Swansea and the Southwest region. I know there was concern about temporary provision made in Carmarthenshire and the impact of damage to documents, not all owned by the, the council, but had to be repaired and restored. So I think this is a critical thing. It's not just, oh, it would be nice to be the standard. There is a legal obligation to meet the standard. So I hope we can do it in the hub because it's lovely if you can have library facilities all on one site but if we can't we will have to start looking for a safe location otherwise as happened when Glamorgan was split up a number of documents disappear down the road towards Cardiff and it's been hard getting them back. Yes that's true you've got a good memory there <laughs> um, 
I, I'd also say you mentioned about the owners of documents, but of course, Nisbet Talbot as well. And uh, the, obviously, uh, this is what Nisbet Talbot would expect of uh, obviously Swansea is the lead authority, um, and uh, we provide that level of um, uh, care of the Nisbet Talbot's collections, who was a significant contributor to the the joint service and uh, and also uh you know some of our finest collections actually are nice talbot based yeah. you know the um it's one of the ironies i often say that when i give strong room tours that you know our fight some of our finest documents in the neath abbey Armworks collection the uh Markham abbey charter the neath abbey charter our oldest document it's it's sort of ironic really that um uh they they all sort of fall within these Patalba and in fact our estate collections uh, there are far more estate collections that have survived from the Neath Patalba area whether that's the Swansea Valley area because we've got quite a few of those so uh, you know if, if you were to say where are the majority of your estate collections I would say the Swansea Valley from Clitter going upwards um, uh, so uh, yeah we, we we owe a duty of care to these and um, the kind of just discussion that we're having now we, we're, we're aware that we we're sort of uh these future generations as well you know that we don't want people to uh criticize in the future saying what on earth were we doing putting the archives in uh you know something that didn't meet the british standard you know uh, particularly I, as I, I mentioned you know these these three pillar things of um uh, security fire and um uh controlled environment a lot of hands up <laughs> yes robert i i think maybe you were next yes thank you chair in terms Kim, you, you mentioned you've been out on site what what's you know what's the next stages in terms of making sure that this complies with or, or can comply with british standards and what's the time scale for a for that analysis and also for any adaptation plans to be drawn up and, and, and an estimate of the cost of this because I assume you know this isn't going to be cheap is it? it it's uh, to do a proper job if there's adaptations required do we have that information at the moment I think I think the uh, the next stage would be the when the rib stage two comes then we have to a decision will have to be made uh, I, I'm, I'm acutely conscious that the, and I, I'm absolutely 100% supportive of the idea of a city centre hub uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea and mm -hmm. it's the, the way forward for the council. I mean, the, the real question is, is it suitable for the archives? Uh, and I wouldn't want for a minute to uh, imperil the project if the for the city centre hub. Um, um, it's just the, the real question is, is it suitable for the archives as well? And I think what we have to, I think the thing that Swansea Council it always has at the back of its mind is it wishes to dispose of the civic centre and uh, redevelop the area as part of the city plan moving forward. But we have to find a solution that is um, sustainable for the archives and it may be the city centre hub or it may we may have to think again going forward. Mm. Uh, but I think that decision presumably is going to be taken by Swansea Council in the first by the cabinet. Robert the cabinet Richard. Swansea, yeah. Yes, yeah. which for which congratulations, I understand you are a cabinet, a cabinet member now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kim. Uh, <laughs> Lyndon, you have your hand up. Great, th th thank you. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that, uh, as others have said, the hub would be a very visible place for the archive because a lot of people would see the archive but yeah it's vital we have a safe environment for the archive and that is paramount um and i think I, like others i've got concerns about things being taken to cardiff um and uh, being from swansea as we all know we don't always like things going down the road to cardiff but i think i have real concerns about that and uh you know it's obviously uh as I think Jen said, you know, we've got we are, we are holding archive material for a lot of other people. So I think it is important that we get this right. And I'm sure I'm sure we will at the end of the day, because I think everybody uh, believes and, and 
uh, really thinks the archive is really valuable to Swansea, as do the people of Swansea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your support. I, I mean, I, I think really I'm carrying the flag of this British standard thing going forward. So, you know, uh, it's not just myself that's saying that, but the National Archives and Welsh Government are saying that. So I think we are absolutely on the same page, uh, the advise, archive advisors in uh, Welsh Government and uh, Liaison Officer for Wales in the National Archives. So uh, I think uh, probably by the next meeting, we, we'll, we'll know, but I, I, we can't compromise. I think they, you can't say, well, it meets part of BS 16, Eight nine three. It meets the, uh, you know, the fire and flood, but it doesn't meet the uh, 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 unless you have very expensive uh, arrangements with regard to um, the environmental um, controls. You know, it, typical things are to to put archives in the space that the public don't want to to use, like whether it's the top floor or <laughs> and people say, I don't want to go up to the top floor because it involves going up in the lift or the stairs or something like that. Oh, we could put the archives up there. But of course, then you've got the roof space and the fact that if the roof leaks or uh, it would heat up during the day and uh, uh, and so on. So it's got to be, as you say, we go back to this concept of a box within a box, really. Uh, it's got to be a secure box within the box that is that building. Yeah. Uh, Jen, you got your hand up again. Thank you. I, I'm aware time is passing and this is a huge topic. Uh, and Kim has described proposals within the existing building that was British Home Stores. Has any thought been given on building a box outside of British Home Stores in what is would be part of the car park? behind British Home Stores and Marks and Spencers? I, as I don't think the, uh, there is space actually from my walk around the thing. I think, I think my, my uh, walk around the back suggests that it's the Marks and Spencers car park for um, blue badge holders around the, the back. And there isn't, there isn't very much space at all there, is there? That's the one down with the that. side of the Cardoma, is it, Kim? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yes. You go yes. that way, yeah. It's, it, that's always been one of the smaller ones, isn't it? It's, it's more of a kind of drop off area mm. um, than a proper car park. Mm. Yeah. Mm. OK, uh, well, th thank you, Kim, and thank you, everybody, for, for those very, very well made points. Um, and I think everybody is uh, very. Um, uh, very aware of the need to ensure that we do absolutely get to this right. And I think the importance of this move can't be underestimated. And uh, I think there'll be you know, quite a lot of uh, uh, attention on, on this item. And I'm sure the right solution will be will be arrived at in, in due course. But uh, it is something that uh, the Archives Committee will be watching closely as, as things progress. So... Thank you, Kim, for that uh, for that report. I'm, I'm just going to gloss over the because the yes. time has moved on. Yeah. So, statistics as presented, uh, meetings as presented, and accessions as presented. If anybody would like to make any comments on those, uh, I'd okay. obviously take any yeah. questions. But uh, yeah. I, I'm conscious we overran. I, I didn't think we were going to meet the yeah. hour. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> famous last words, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> would Would anybody like to make any observations or comments on the remaining items? Not wishing to rush things through, but we are conscious that uh, it should be an hour. I don't think we've yet managed to to meet an hour. Uh, having said that, Kim, uh, you know, you, you said at the very beginning it was going to be a light meeting, but uh, yeah. we've had some really, really interesting discussions Definitely, and yeah. contributions from everybody. So, so thank you all for for your input. It's hugely valuable, and I'm sure it's extremely helpful to Kim to know exactly how we feel about the matters that are on the agenda. It's very, um, it's, it's very helpful for him to be able to take that forward and to know that we are uh, so supportive 
of, of what you and your staff are, are, are doing, Kim. So I think in the year ahead, there's lots for us to look forward to. Uh, after the last year, with everything being so uncertain, let's hope that this starts off a better year for, for everybody. Say so lots to look forward to with things reopening, business hopefully getting back to normal. But, you know, we can take great pride from what the archives has done over the last year. The archives, the annual report has really highlighted that. As I said previously, um, it is a gem of a service. We are rightly proud of what you do and, and what you achieve year on year. You fly the flag for West Glamorgan, if not Wales, across Wales and, and, and the UK. So well done to, to everybody. I think the stats are what they are, aren't they? They reflect the situation at the moment. Um, and every cloud has a silver lining. You've mentioned the really positives that have come out. The online stuff with the extended reach uh, that's been achieved through that has got to be a real plus. And uh, we'll, we'll build on that. And um, yes, we, we look forward to business getting back to normal and hopefully being able to meet physically. Perhaps our next meeting will actually be in the Civic Centre and we will have the opportunity to look at some of these lovely acquisitions that have been made. I mean, the, the beautiful illuminated ad addresses. Uh, I would certainly love to look at those, you know, the, the charters that, that you have there. And of course, of course, we've mentioned in the past the Innes Kedwin papers and things like that. So hopefully we'll be able to to, over the next 12 months come to you and, and rejoice in what we've got there in, in archives and see them for ourselves. So thank you everybody for your contributions. It's been an extremely interesting and entertaining meeting. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we look forward to, to seeing everybody in, in three months time. Yep. Thank, thank you. you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.